The president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, was received and welcomed with an official ceremony at the Emir of Diwan Palace, hosted by the Emir of Qatar, Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. The official visit is intended to bolster bilateral relations. In Ecuador, the indigenous leader Leonidas Issa, who was arrested after calling for a national strike against President Guillermo Lasso, was released early on Wednesday morning. More than 3,000 people in Burkina Faso, mostly children, fled the northern village of Saitenga after an attack carried out by unidentified assailants. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. As part of his Eurasian tour, the president of Venezuela, Nicolás Maduro Moros, arrived in Qatar. The official visit is intended to bolster bilateral relations. The Venezuelan president was received by senior officials of the Qatari government upon his arrival at Doha's international airport. Then, Maduro was welcomed with an official ceremony at the Emiri D1 Palace, hosted by the Emir of Qatar, Tamim bin Hamad Al Thani. After solemnly listening to the anthems of both countries, the two leaders held a meeting in which they discussed international economic and energy issues, as well as the prospects for bilateral cooperation between Venezuela and Qatar. In 2015, the Bolivarian president also made an official visit to Qatar, a nation country that has one of the highest energy potentials in the world. The South American president has also visited Turkey, Algeria, Iran and Kuwait in the framework of this tour with a broad cooperation agenda that focuses on the areas of science and technology, agriculture, transportation, energy, tourism and culture. Now we move on to other topics. Colombian prison workers denounce presidential candidate Rodolfo Hernandez on charges of defamation. The second municipal court of small labor cases of Bogota admitted an action filed by the Union of Prison Workers and the Union of the National Penitentiary and Prison Institute against the presidential candidate Rodolfo Hernandez for damaging the institution's reputation. On Twitter, the union demanded respect for prison workers while assuring that there are more than 16,000 families who make a living from this profession. This message was accompanied by a video in which Rodolfo Hernandez points out in a broad generalization the level of corruption in the National Penitentiary and Prison Institute. Social organizations for the defense of human rights in Colombia presented a report on what they consider to be the failures of Ivan Duque's government. According to a document known as Hunger and War, the Legacy of the Apprentice, there was an increase in the number of murders of social leaders during the administration of President Ivan Duque from 116 victims in 2016 to 310 in 2020 alone, while so far in 2022 there have been 81 assassinations. Massacres, on the other hand, went from 9 in 2016 to 33 in 2020. The report also revealed that in 2020 the following women's and employment together with the youth unemployment caused more than 2,150,000 people to fall into poverty. The group highlighted that the current government failed to comply with the goals of the development plan in relation to social issues and with the peace agreements signed in 2016. Now we address other topics. The Mexican government is getting ready to vaccinate children between the ages of 5 and 11 against COVID-19. 
The authorities explain that the immunization against the coronavirus for this group of children will begin on Thursday. The Undersecretary of Public Health Prevention, Hugo lopez Gatel, informed that the pharmaceutical company Pfizer-BioNTech will provide the country with 8 million doses of anti-COVID-19 vaccines for minors. The official explained that this is the seventh stage of the immunization program designed in the country to contain COVID-19 infections. The government pointed out that the goal is to give the doses to 15.4 million children before December and that the campaign will be carried out by municipalities. The World Health Organization Director General Tedros Adhanom Ghebreyesus said on Tuesday we'll meet on June 23rd to determine whether to classify the global monkeypox outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern. The emergency committee will discuss the designation, which is the highest alarm in the UN agency can sound. Before the last few months, monkeypox had been generally confined to Western and Central Africa. To fight the global spread, the WHO aims to recommend tried and tested public health tools, including surveillance, contact tracing, and isolation of infected patients. Tedros said that 1,600 confirmed monkeypox cases, and as well as 1,500 suspected cases, Cases have been reported to the WHO this year from 39 countries, 32 of which have been recently hit by the virus. While 72 fatalities have been reported in countries where monkeypox has already endemic, none have been seen in the newly affected countries, WHO Director General said. I think it, it's now clear that there is um, uh, unusual uh, uh, situation meaning even the virus is is, is behaving unusually from how uh, it used to behave in in in, in the past uh, but not only that it's also affecting more and 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 more countries so far this year more than 1600 confirmed cases and almost 1,500 suspected cases of monkeypox have been reported to WHO from 39 countries, including seven countries where monkeypox has been detected for years and 32 newly affected countries. I think. We'll take a short break now. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. In Ecuador, the indigenous leader Leonidas Issa, who was arrested after calling for a national strike against President Guillermo Lasso, was released early Wednesday morning. On Tuesday night, Judge Paola Bedón ordered the immediate release of the president of the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities, Gnaye, and issued alternative measures to preventive detentions, such as the prohibition to leave the country and the periodic presentation before the prosecutor's office every Wednesday and Friday. Also, she determined a hearing for July 4th, in which the indigenous leader will face the charge of alleged perpetrator of the crime of paralyzing a public service. The arrest of Lenida Sisa, described as illegal, by the Confederation of Indigenous Identities was carried out in the early hours of Tuesday morning by elite groups of police in the sector El Chasqui in the province of Cotopaxi. And upon being released, the indigenous leader denounced political persecution by the government of Guillermo Lasso. The arrest of Leonidas Issa, him being a leader of people and nationalities at national level, is an act of persecution and political imprisonment by the national government. So, comrades, we denounce this to the world. On his part, the president of the Confederation of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, Leonidas Sisa, said that the social struggle is prompted by neoliberal policies that keep millions of Ecuadorians in poverty. You should not minimize the government because here the problem is not Leonidas. Leonidas is just one morph of the millions of Ecuadorians who are living in poverty. So, if you want to solve the problem of the social struggle, then solve the most acute problems of our community, 
of the most impoverished society of our country. Now we move on to other topics. A truck carrying 34 tons of sand fell into a major river in the Peruvian capital, the Chilon River, near the district of Huaros. Local civil defense authorities said the spill meant the loss of close to 600 tons of trout that were being raised in fish farms in the area. Meanwhile, the water company of the Peruvian capital, Lima, located a few kilometers away from the incident, said the spill did not affect their water source for the northern area of the capital. Miguel Pastrana, the trout farm manager, showed how the sink was darkened the waters of the fish and how some fish have died as a result of the spill. The authorities have just arrived and are conducting their own analysis to determine the contamination levels in the drought. Supposedly, they will present a report later on revealing what the contamination levels are. In the United States, all entrances to Yellowstone National Park, one of the largest and best known national parks in the country, have been temporarily closed due to heavy flooding, mudslides, and extremely dangerous conditions. Park officials sent more than 10,000 visitors, all but a group of backpackers, were evacuated on Tuesday while they were assessing flood damage. Superintendent Cam uh, Scholli said visitors were asked to leave after roads and bridges were flooded, and power was out due to heavy rains and snow melt. The Yellowstone River overflowed to historic levels, and it washed out several sections of the main roads on the park's north entrance. We have complete team operation, four land rescues and two air rescues. We have had a staffing operation up and down the Yellowstone River Valley, outside residence and location throughout the county. Now we are transporting resources to the affected areas, providing gas and restoring service to garner communities, and having law enforcement and search and rescue operation remain in those areas. The European Commission launched a new legal action against the United Kingdom, accusing London of threatening peace in Northern Ireland by trying to overhaul the past Brexit trade deal. On Monday, the British government introduced legislation to rip up past Brexit trading rules for Northern Ireland in an attempt to override the European Union withdrawal to the treaty that it had signed. Prime Minister Boris Johnson government insisted in not breaking international law, citing a necessity to act to restore Northern Ireland's power-sharing institutions. But Brussels rejected this argument, and according to the Vice President of the European Commission, Maros Sefcovic, legal action will be taken, with two new cases joining those the Commission had suspended. There is no legal nor political justification whatsoever for unilaterally changing an international agreement. Opening the door to unilaterally changing an international agreement is a breach of international law as well. Concerns are growing about a possible economic recession in the United States as government officials weigh sharp prices in interest rates to try to control an inflation that reached 8.6% in May. Economists fear that higher borrowing costs will curb economic growth and lead to stagflation, where stagnant economic growth coupled with inflation will force a recession. Prices at the gas pump show that how much the inflation is hurting consumers in the world's largest economy. The average price of gas is up to five U.S. dollars a gallon, pushing transport costs up to across the country. The Federal Reserve will announce its decision on a new round of interest rate increases on Wednesday after a two-day monetary policy meeting with many analysts expecting the largest rate hike since 1994. I do think probably the Federal Reserve was a little late in starting to raise interest rates, probably overly focused on maximum employment and losing sight of the, the inflationary concerns out there. I think it's, it's hard to overemphasize the role that the 
uncertainty within the global economy right now, but the global environment is also particularly precarious right now. Given the outsized role that food and energy consumption plays, particularly in the developing world, I do think probably- And we have more news coming up after a final short break. So stay with us. Welcome back. More than 3,000 people in Burkina Faso, mostly children, fled the northern village of Saitenga after an attack carried out by unidentified assailants. According to eyewitnesses, the carnage began late on Saturday in this town in northern Burkina Faso, a few kilometers from Niger. Unidentified assailants first attacked a military police post in Saitenga, a department of Sino province, killing 11 dams in the process. The Burkina Army announced that it had killed some 40 jihadists following a previous attack last Thursday. Government officials stated the armed men returned to, the, to attack the village to avenge their fatalities. The Zaytenga attack is the second deadliest recorded in the West African nation after the June 2021 attack on the village of Solhan, also in the north near Niger. The cost of domestic air force has increased significantly over the course of 2022, rising 47 percent since January. According to recent ADOB analytics data, which measures direct consumer transactions from six of the top 10 United States airlines, may mark the fourth month in a row when prices rose over pre-pandemic levels. Last month, prices surged 30 percent, compared to the same period in 2019. Meanwhile, prices for domestic flights were up 27 percent in April and 20 percent in March, compared to the pre-pandemic numbers. At the same time, prices in February were up 5 percent, compared to 2019 levels. South Korea's unionized truckers and the Transport Ministry reached an agreement on minimum pay guarantees, ending a nationwide strike that caused nationwide logistic disruptions and delays. Members of the cargo truckers' solidarity under the wing of the Korean Confederation of Trade Unions reached an agreement with the Transport Ministry and decided to end the strike that began on June 7th and return to work. The union has been demanding an extension of the safe trucking freight rate system designed to prevent dangerous driving and guarantee minimum freight rates for truck drivers. The system was introduced for a three-year run in 2020 and scheduled to end December 31st, but the two sides reportedly agreed to keep the system in place. The latest round of talks were held at a major industrial transport hub near the capital. European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen oversaw the signing ceremony of a trilateral memorandum of understanding to export natural gas from Israel and Egypt to the EU countries. EU Commission Chief made the announcement during a joint press conference with Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi in Cairo. The deal aimed at eliminating the bloc's dependency on Russian fossil fuels by turning to other supplies. Israel exports gas to Egypt, some of which is then liquefied and shipped to Europe. A significant increase in gas exports will require major long-term infrastructure investments. The bloc has been considering another option but about using the EastMed project, a proposal for seafloor pipeline linking Israel to Greece and Italy via Cyprus. But United States President Joe Biden's administration has questioned the viability of the project, given its huge cost and the time it will take to complete. The United Nations World Food Program on Tuesday appealed for $426 million to stave off a famine in South Sudan, where conflict and floods have placed millions at risk. WFP's program officer for South Sudan, Adeyinka Badejo, explained that South Sudan is facing its hungriest year since independence. The reasons, she said, were accumulative. 
continuing subnational conflict, climate crisis of three consecutive years of floods and severe economic shocks exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic and now the conflict in Ukraine. This year, the WFP had planned to provide food assistance for 6.2 million people, but mounting demands and insufficient funds meant that the agency in April had to suspend help for 1.7 million of these people, deemed to be in relatively lower categories of food insecurity. We are already in a crisis, but we need to restore food assistance in areas where we have suspended to prevent people from falling into starvation and famine. To do so, we urgently require 426 million US dollars for the next six months to cover the, ne the needs for the next six months. More than two thirds of the South Sudanese population are experiencing a serious humanitarian and protection crisis and require humanitarian assistance to survive. Of these, we estimate that 8.3 million people, including internally displaced persons and refugees, will endure acute severe hunger during the lean season. Telesur expands its signal with new satellite parameters. Since more than ever, the world connects to us and our stories are being heard in other farther away nations. These parameters are in place since June 1st in Latin America and the Caribbean, both in English and in Spanish, and quite soon further changes will be implemented for the signals in Europe, the Middle East, and Africa. This new multi-platform will continue providing truthful content to oppose the hegemonic media's narrative and our faithfulness to our audience. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesurienglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesur English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.